There was, though, a brief security scare at the Capitol today. The complex was in lockdown for about an hour after a fire broke out nearby. What turned out to be a homeless person having a worse day than usual. But the incident underscores how tense things are in the days, hours now, really, before Joe Biden's inauguration. It comes fewer than two weeks since insurrectionists breached the halls of power to block Biden's free and fair election win. Reporting from among the rioters that day was veteran war correspondent Luke Mogelson. Take a look at this video he captured for the New Yorker magazine as a group of attackers made it inside the Senate chamber. So as you can see there, I don't know if you heard, I don't know if you heard the words there from inside that video. Um, talking about Ted Cruz, you hear the protesters saying, "I think Cruz would want us to do this." Name checking Josh Hawley. Those rioters, insurrectionists, believe they were acting at Cruz's behest with Ted's blessing. There's also this from the minute-by-minute -minute video archive of the day uh, that the folks at ProPublica Pro have put out. This is the reverse angle of that police officer famously luring a mob away from the doors uh, to the Senate chamber while lawmakers were still inside. One of the thousands of videos posted on the Parler app, the rioters bragging that they were there uh, creating content, sharing it with the masses. Now, you only do that if A, you are incredibly stupid, or B, you feel emboldened that someone in power has your back, whether it's the the president of the United States or the junior senators from Texas and Missouri or a freshman congresswoman from Colorado. We saw Congressman Boebert uh, taking a group of people for a tour uh, sometime after the third and before the sixth. I don't remember the day we were walking in a uh, tunnel. We saw her and commented that who she was and she had a large group with her. She might have had a large number of people coming to be with her on this historic occasion and just wanting to give them the opportunity to have a tour. But it was pretty clear that her team is, a, is, the, is the team. She, she's not on the home team. She was with the visitors. Steve Cohen is the first Democrat to name names, though we should point out that that name, Lauren Boebert, denies conspiring with the criminals who attacked the Capitol, despite tweeting on January 6th that this is our 1776. She said in a letter on Thursday that she has never given a tour of the Capitol to any outside group or insurrectionists. But she did vow as a candidate to carry her Glock with her to work at the Capitol. She did refuse to let police officers search her bag after she set off metal detectors in the wake of the attack. And she has expressed support for QAnon. She, along with Marjorie Taylor Greene, are members of the House's new conspiracy caucus, shall we say. Is it any wonder that some Democrats don't feel safe right now coming to work, not because of the coronavirus or another attack, although they may fear those things too, but because they also fear the actions of their own GOP colleagues. Let's turn now to Democratic Congressman Brendan Boyle of Pennsylvania. Uh, Congressman, thank you for joining us on the show. Uh, let me start with that powerful video taken by the New Yorker's war correspondent inside the Senate chamber in which two of the insurrectionists appeared to be motivated uh, by Senator Ted Cruz's rhetoric. Uh, Democratic Senator Brian Schatz tweeted yesterday that if someone who tried to overthrow the government invoked my name on the Senate floor as he rifled through my papers saying I was cool with it, I would put out a statement. So far, Senator Cruz has been silent. Uh, what's your reaction to that video and to the silence from Ted Cruz? Well, Brian uh, is right. And, you know, the, it, I'm reminded, I can't remember who said it, but... Great ambition uh, combined with a lack of principle is a toxic combination. And I think of that when I think of the likes of Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley. The whole reason why they went along with the big lie was to one-up one another to get a head start on Iowa 2024. That's what this was all about. It was a completely cynical game 
that they thought they could get away with in order to gain a little bit of advantage in a vain effort to attempt to inherit the Trumpist movement. That's what all of this was about and, and is about. What we need to do now, though, is figure out some sort of consequences for all of those who went along with the big lie. And I think there are varying degrees of culpability, yep. from Trump at the top to Hawley and Cruz, all the way down to those who simply, I say simply, decided to cast aside the legally cast 7 million votes from my state of Pennsylvania. I, that is something that we will have to wrestle with now. I would expect you would see that once the trial of Donald Trump in the Senate is over. So um, Axios, as Jonathan Swan is reporting, that in reaction uh, to Lauren Boebert's primary win, Boebert, who we just mentioned a moment ago, when she won her primary, apparently President Trump had this to say about her and QAnon. He said, quote, you know, people say they're into all kinds of bad things, referring to QAnon, and say all kinds of terrible things about them, Trump added. But, you know, my understanding is they basically are just people who want good government. The room fell silent. Nobody knew how to respond. Uh, Congressman, how do you feel about not just having a president who thinks QAnon are good people interested in good government, but having members of Congress who sympathize with or openly support uh, a movement that the FBI has called a domestic extremist threat? Well, uh, certainly my new colleagues, um, Bobert, I can't even recall her first name, and then the crazy QAnon lady in Lauren. Georgia are, are both uh, in incredibly extreme. Um, but I'm going to draw a distinction with Trump, and you may disagree with me. My view of Trump is, and keep in mind, at various points in his life, he's been a Democrat, a Republican, a Reform Party member, an Independent, a Democrat again, and then a Republican again. He's a man who, in my view, has no ideology. For Trump, it's just, are you with him or are you against him? If you praise Trump, if you say nice things about him, he will love you. He, he will uh, praise you to the hilt uh, as long as you're with him. And then if you say even the least bit uh, against him, like Kevin McCarthy, who's been the biggest suck up in the world to Trump, but recently took many baby steps toward distancing himself. And now we see today Trump is bashing him. That's that's Trump's ideology. That's his litmus test. Are you saying nice things about Trump? Are you totally obsequious? Are yeah. you loyal or are you not? So I would draw I would draw that distinction. I agree with you to an extent in the sense that you're right. Uh, he'll back anyone who praises him. The problem is everyone who's praising him right now are far-right yeah. groups, and they're praising him yeah. because he's saying and doing things that they like, whether it's immigration, Islamophobia, right. border walls, attacking yeah. minorities, etc. Let's talk about Donald Trump. He's been impeached in the House by you and your colleagues a second time, first president ever to be impeached twice. We're expecting his impeachment trial to begin in the Senate very soon. I understand, though, that you're, you believe more should be done to hold him to account. Yeah, no question about it. I, actually, I, I think that the resolution that I dropped last week, for me, is even more significant than what the Senate decides to do. I believe there is sufficient evidence, just based on what we already know, to charge Donald Trump specifically with two crimes. And I cite them in the resolution. Uh, one is solicitation to create or to commit a crime of violence. The other is seditious conspiracy. I think you might find more crimes as you actually conduct the investigation, both leading up to January 6th and what Trump was or was not doing on the afternoon of January 6th when everything was unfolding in the Capitol and some of us were barricaded in our offices and Trump refused to lift a finger to help us, even his own vice president, who's been the definition of loyal for the last four years. So in my view, uh, once you get a minute beyond noon on Wednesday, we now know, of course, that Donald Trump, as an ex-president, will not be under the protection of the Justice Department directive against indicting sitting presidents. I want to see him criminally investigated. Uh, I believe there's already enough to indict him and to put him on trial. That, to me, would be the ultimate justice. I mean, one, uh, one thing you said that jumped out at me, you said, when we start digging into this, we may find other crimes. Yeah. One of my big criticisms of House Democrats and Nancy Pelosi over the last few years was that you didn't impeach him earlier, you didn't investigate him earlier. When you did impeach him, you went for a very narrow Ukraine phone call. A lot of these crimes that you want to see him charged for and stand trial for could have been uncovered by House committees if you'd actually gone after him during the time he was in office. 
Yeah, I mean, the problem we, uh, you know, not uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, but re keep in mind one of the biggest problems we had, and this is something that systemically, by the way, needs to be addressed uh, even once beyond Trump leaves the stage. We would go ahead and subpoena these folks for evidence or subpoena them to testify. They would refuse them, and then it would get tied up into the courts for upwards of, of two years. That really frustrated the investigations that happen in Congress. So I would like, I mean, forget Donald Trump. For the next potential future autocrat out there, or a president who wants to be unresponsive to the co-equal branch of government, Congress, the first article of the Constitution, we need to make sure that we have enforcement power of our subpoenas, because I think in many ways, the Trump presidency is instructive about the flaws in our system and norms that we relied on before yes. that need to go from norms to actual law. 100%. Yes. Uh, before I let you go, Congressman, I do want to ask about just going back to the day itself, to January the 6th. Uh, I, I understand the staff that was with you sheltering in place that day was because of COVID protocols, uh, mostly a younger staff, uh, mostly in their 20s. Uh, Nancy Pelosi talked on 60 Minutes recently about how her staff, uh, they barricaded the door. They, they were, you know, they were naturals at hiding because of what they'd learned in school during shooting drills. Uh, is that your experience? Do you think that's the same thing? Because that's a horrifying thing to have to say, that people are good at avoiding shooters in Congress because they learned in school. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's heartbreaking. My, my wife is an elementary school teacher and my daughter's in the first grade. And they're already quite familiar with um, the drills that you have to go through in, in case there's a, a shooting. Um, for me, I had only three staffers present on that day, mostly because of COVID. We've been working short staff, the rest of the people working virtually. And, you know, most of the people who work on Capitol Hill are young, are in their 20s or in their, their early 30s. I'm young for Congress, but I'm actually old compared to my staff. Um, the, the reality is this is mostly young people, very young people who are working tremendous hours for little pay. And unfortunately, there's a perception out there in society that is so different about um, who actually does the work of, of our government versus reality. Yeah, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, did you also have issues, were you one of the House Democrats who had issues with maskless Republicans in the secure oh, room? I left. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the safe room, it might have been safer from the crazies outside, but it wasn't safe from the crazies inside. Um, so my staff and I, did not stay long in the safe room, um, about a half hour, 45 minutes. And then we went back to our office and barricaded ourselves in there because of our concerns about COVID. There were actually two concerns. First, there were just so many people in the room. That was one of them. And then second, there were about uh, 10, a dozen or so Republican members who refused to wear masks. And uh, given that, it, we just thought it would be safer to go back where we were. Yeah, I don't blame you, to be honest. I mean, uh, being in such a difficult situation, as you say, you've got a crowd of uh, attackers threatening your lives, and then you've got Republicans without masks on uh, also threatening your lives. And obviously, some of your colleagues have tested positive uh, in the weeks since that attack. Uh, Congressman Brendan Boyle, we appreciate you taking time out for us tonight. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.